A very good afternoon, and you're, you're, you're most welcome. There's two talks going on at the moment. In the O'Reilly Hall, there's a talk in architecture. There's quite a large crowd there. So the, this impression that Irish people are only interested <laughs> in the drink <laughs> is not true. But the intelligent people have come here to the club. Yeah. Um, because have, have the people in the architecture talk been told this is on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. In about 10 minutes. No, 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 no. They, 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 they'd all run up. So we had to keep it a secret. We had to keep it a secret. Can I just put it in the context for a moment uh, when we are in the hallowed halls or the concrete corridors of collaboration of UCD that um, the whiskey business, as I observe it, is very different than the predecessor uh, explosion there was in craft brewing. Um, now, now, you can disagree with me, even on the panel, uh, et cetera, but they're, you know, they're, they're sometimes, they're, they're all beverages, but they're sometimes lumped together as one growth spurt, and they're so different. And the difference is, if you're going to invest in the whiskey business, it's a serious investment. It's long-term. You'll be waiting for a return. If you're successful, the return will be quite significant. But uh, it's, it's very different. The, the um, craft beer thing, uh, you know, if you're my age, you remember Ireland when, usually it was men went to the pub and they talked about their team from the parish, uh, from the province or from the premiership. And then they started, about 10 years ago, started talking about the actual beer they were drinking. Do you know what I mean? And this whole thing. So it came from the ground up, the bar stool up, right? So when I would be consulting with businesses, you know, if they're in the brewing business, um, it's, it's usually started out very, very small. Whereas, now I don't mean to embarrass you, you'd be amazed how different, the, I, I shouldn't say calibre, because that sounds almost like a professional snobbery, but what you find in the whiskey business, there are people with proven track records in business then decide to, 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 to plunge. Now, we couldn't get any of those. <laughs> so, so, so we have our... Call. No, but, 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 but like, yeah. essentially, that is a yeah. big difference. That, um, so, uh, Jack, I'm going to ask you, yeah. do you feel comfortable or do, do, do you like people to see it differently? Because I, I, it is very different. Am I, I, I think they're different. Am I right or I am I really they're right? They're different industries, <laughs> but the opportunity are driven by the same thing, which is yeah. a consumer trend yeah. for looking for something different. Um, and people are looking for different beers and a different experience and they want something local that has people behind it, a store behind it. And it's the same thing that's happening in whiskey. The numbers are just very different. And I think people who go into beer, it's more of a lifestyle. Yeah. So you can spend a couple of hundred grand and you can have a, a brewery and they soon find out that they spend all their time running around d depositing kegs and it's a very, very hard industry to get in. And it's, it's fast moving consumer goods. Whiskey is slow moving consumer goods and is much more, let's say, brand intensive. Uh, and capital intensive in terms of the barriers to entry. So, so it's around five to 10 million to build a distillery. Um, and God knows how much it's gonna be to lay down inventory and also build a brand. So, so it's, a, it's a tough industry. There's a lot of entrepreneurs looking at coming into the space because when I set up in 2012, there was like five distilleries. Now there's over 25 distilleries. Um, and there, it, there is a bit of a sense that, look, I've got a shed in my backyard. I'm gonna build a distillery. They're not the, the ones that, that are going to succeed or actually uh, get the risk capital to do it, but uh, uh, you know, I think everyone's been attracted by the opportunity. Uh, and the category's going through phenomenal growth. Uh, it needs choice, needs breadth, needs entrepreneurs doing something different. Uh, but I would question, will all these newer projects succeed as well? All right. Yeah, I'd, 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 yeah, I'd go ahead, agree. Go ahead. I set up a distillery and a brewery, so I've seen both sides of it. Um, you were greedy. Uh, yeah, <laughs> or just desperate. <laughs> yeah. Running out of money fast. Um, I'd agree with Jack, absolutely. I think there's lots of differences in terms of the capital required. The, uh, when you look at even to access that capital, you're not going to do it unless you've got some backing or experience. Uh, I do think the factors that drove it 10 years ago are the same. There was a lot of people looking for uh, more local products. Why, why, when you went into the pub and you were talking about your team, was there only four beers on the bar? And you know, why were they imported beers? Or why was Guinness the only local beer? You know, that just inherently seemed wrong. And I think a lot of the, re the, the reasons that drove the growth in craft beer were the same with craft distilling, be it in the US and bourbon or over here, what we're seeing in Irish. It's, it's looking for local stories, smaller stories, more authentic stories. Um, absolutely, the capital thing is, is spot on. Um, and the other thing which is common between two of them, whether you raise 
200 grand and put a, dis, a brewery, a small brewery in, or you raise, raise 10 bar and build a distillery, it's a slog. You know, there's no getting away from the fact that uh, whether it's whiskey or gin or beer, it's just hard graft. And I think sometimes the uh, there's a romanticism around entre mm. entrepreneurship and, you know, it's kind of seen as maybe being cool and uh, the reality can be quite uh, quite different. It, it's a hard graft either either way. And we're, we're very lucky with the panel because Elaine has selected people who are at different stages. So uh, Teeling Whiskey, you know, the, has the heritage of uh, John and Cooley and now Jack and Stephen. Uh, uh, and then we have uh, Brian, uh, who's, uh, you know, has been up and running a number of years at Glenda Lock. Then we have uh, Jerry. You've just opened. Uh, I'll have. come to you in a moment. Uh, and then we've June, who's who's literally waiting for, uh, has a great story to tell, this plant to come in yeah. like this this week. Mm. But um, you, you've just opened a power score. So I'm, go I'm going to pop around each of you and just yep. sort of tell us a little bit about your, your business. And uh, I suppose, Jerry as well, you know, you're all in the same sector, but you've got to make your brand different. Then. So yeah. what's different about power score? Well, uh, that's it. We are all in the same sector, but uh, we're uh, going for different ends of the market. So what makes Periscourt uh, different is really the location there. The, the reason why we decided to locate there was that it gets half a million tourists each year. And from that market, we hope to tap in because the same target market that's going to the hotel as it is going to the golf club. So you've got Americans and you've got Asians there, and they are the people that are buying our whiskey. So as the guys know, to get over the three years, you have to have some sort of edit revenue streams and with that footfall that's what we're hoping to do in terms of um, provide those revenue streams to get through the first three years. The second element is I suppose Jack knows it well uh, we have Noel our master distiller who is um, ex Cooley and he's really the one who's forged the um, and, and John and uh, Jack of course who have forged the whiskey revival there like he's made whiskies like Connemara, Tullamore, uh, uh, Kilbegan, and uh, with his expertise and credentials there, it really makes Periscourt, you know, able to really establish itself as a credible brand. Um, the third element will be four sites in terms of the plant there. We have the best facility uh, that money can buy for the size that we're, we're going for. And then with our visitor center there, we're hoping to bring people in, turn them into brand ambassadors and send them out. And through that and through the word of mouth that we hope to build the brand slowly here in Ireland and then go overseas and, and do it that way. So, yeah. OK, uh, J so, Jack, yeah. Yeah, just, just to, to, to uh, uh, come back on that one is, uh, I got married in Paris Court and I said uh, uh, many years ago, if I wasn't going to build a distillery in Dublin, I think Power Court's a brilliant magic, place to actually magic, do it. Magic place. Because you have yeah, that captive yeah, audience yeah, yeah, yeah. and you have the barley fields, you have the water and all yeah, that. But Jack, stuff. that but was the locks up bad either. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but that was before he poached your 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 Well no no was a hard of a a reason I'm sitting in between. But we'd moved on from then, so yeah, yeah, There's big money in the transfer market. Um June, um you know when I was talking about the different type of it, because all of you have business track records. So, so before you took the leap, Brian, what were you doing? Because uh, you and a few friends decided to yeah, yeah, set I up Glendalough. Yeah, uh, I was in Davy actually with, uh, I saw Pat, uh, June's husband there. I worked with Pat and Davy for a number of years. I had sort of a, a link in that I was the beverage analyst, so I thought really naively that that gave me any sort of insight into, uh, <laughs> into setting so up. So you were crunching the numbers, crunch, but yeah, you didn't realize there's a job making them. Yeah, Jesus. <laughs> and uh, yeah, within yeah. about six months, it was like, pff, I didn't have a clue. I was just about naive enough to think I could give it a go. And then... Uh, yeah, but what I'm saying is there's business track records. Ah, yeah. it's, it, it, it's, uh, you know, and as I say, I'm not, not, not all craft beer is, but like, it's not lifestyle stuff. What were you doing? Uh, well, I, I was a, a management consultant in Accenture, and uh, I actually see my old boss down there somewhere, Fergus. Ahern. <laughs> but um, I worked in financial services, so in the banks here and then in the banks in the UK. And I uh, really got to the point uh, in my mid 30s or early 30s that um, everything that we were creating was intangible. Like there was nothing you could stand in front of and say, I built that. I'm proud of that. It was all on computer screens, it was all on Excel sheets. So um, in my 31st birthday, came home from the UK. And uh, my father, myself, my sister, and my brother-in-law, uh, my sister's husband, 
we decided to build a distillery. So we were looking for a couple of locations around the country and uh, Avoca, Kildare. Mm. But as Jack said, uh, I grew up in Periscourt, well, beside Periscourt in Inniscarry there. And in terms of locations, footfall, five-star hotel, two championship golf courses, the house, the gardens, uh, sure, what more would you want? <laughs> so, yeah, so, 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 so you, you were chasing footfall, and that, yeah. that takes us to June. Yeah. Now, June, sorry to introduce you like this, but, uh, you know, you were a feared and fearsome corporate law. In fact, I, I would still speak in the present <laughs> tense. I know you, you, you gave up your, your but, but you know, you were, you know, top corporate lawyer and you decided to jack it all for whiskey. Yeah. <laughs> Seemed like a good idea at the time, like I say. Um, yeah, I suppose, as I said to you, though, when we were talking about this, the skills at the stage we're at now, they're the same skills every day. I'm still a corporate lawyer because I'm doing trademarks, I'm doing licensing, we've just bought the factory, we're doing regular... It's a very regulated industry. And to pick up on, on Brian's point, this is graft. And um, as well as graft, it's about discipline, I think. And I think that's a really important element as well, that you have to have the discipline to know that when you have something to do, and that involves bribery often, you know, you sit yourself Corporate down here and you, you, of myself, I should say, <laughs> bribery of myself, I sit, you have to sit down and get it done. So um, I suppose at the stage I was at, you know, I'm, I've been exiled in Dublin now for about 25 years. Um, and it was, uh, it was, I was really looking for a connection to, to, to go home. And home for me is uh, Car Savine on the Ring of Kerry. Um, and uh, not only do we have all of what Paris Court have, but we have the ocean sitting in front of us as well. So um, there was a certain <laughs> amount of... Uh, oh, and a, and a right. modesty. <laughs> and modesty that comes from Kerry, yeah. yeah. And uh, so I suppose, you know, when you, we looked at what kind of a business that we'd be interested in getting into, um, you had to look and place your strengths. And our strengths were our location. Our strengths were... Um, Tell the audience about your belief about if you put castles, golf and whiskey together, you'll, you'll make millions. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite as naively as that, but I suppose when you look at Ireland and you try and see, you know, what exactly is a premium product here? What is it that makes somebody go in, uh, ladies, and buy a 45 euro Chanel lipstick when you know that it's exactly the same lipstick across the road in Marks and Spencer's for seven Please tell me the answer to that because <laughs> <laughs> I, I asked Because you about buy what, a lot of lipstick. Uh, yeah, uh, yes, exactly. <laughs> so I suppose in that context, you know, it is about the branding. And, and, yeah. and, and in France, it's, it's fashion. And in Italy, it's leather uh, goods. And in Ireland, it's golf, castles, and whiskey. Mm. Um, and I, it's also probably literature, actually, and learning. Um, which is, I suppose, what UCD would say they pride themselves in in terms of um, yeah, going out to work. Probably not as good as UCC. Yeah, 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 well, yeah, I wasn't going to say that, but yeah. now that you mention it. Uh, but I, so I suppose if you, you look at what that is, you know, they seem to be the three premium issues. And when we looked at home on the Ring of Kerry, we have one million, as we say in Kerry, vehicles passing the front door of the factory. And um, there's eight five-star hotels on the Ring of Kerry, um, two world-class golf links out the road and a factory that was a former sock factory, um, which uh, the warehouse is two and a half thousand square metres, had all the zonings, and the zonings in this business are tricky. I think the lads Key. will agree. Yep. Um, back to the point about opening it in your back garden, the zonings, Irish water will break your heart. Um, so there's, there's lots of various elements and all of those things. Yeah, because, uh, funny enough, because you're in a scenic area, yeah, you have to go out and buy a factory. That's you, you, you be. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're on the Skellig yeah. Coast. Yeah. You know, and unless uh, you're Trump, they're not going to change. Well, the planning even for you know, you. we're yeah. yeah, Kerry might be different from Claire, you might find in that as well. So, yeah. um, so uh, yeah, they're, they're not going to change the planning for you. So, finding a factory which uh, used to make socks, sports socks, Wilson sports socks, right there that is on the Ring of Kerry, which surrounded by five special areas of conservation, and on the planning map had one little red ring around it zoned for commercial. So in our planning process, it was relatively simple. But sorry, you, you're sitting in Grand Canal Dock and William mm. Fry in your big corner office, right? Mm. You must have had a really bad day, did you? Or sorry, <laughs> <laughs> no, but you say, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to jack this and I'm going to do whiskey. I, you know, it wasn't even the I'm going to jack this and I'm going to do whiskey. It was more of a slower process for me. I always wanted to run my own business and I always wanted to spend more time in Kerry. So after three or four years of looking at the two of those and how to make those work. Um, and as I said, the site was crucial. I can't overstate that. 
um, you know, we take our name 618 from the 618 steps to the monastery on Schellig. And while the monks were half mad to go and do that, you know, 1500 years ago, equally, I might be half as mad as well. But sure, there you go. You know, um, sometimes you just have to jump. Um, OK, but what's what, what's happening here, Jack, is there's a formula emerging, right? And I know Newmarket, you, you, you did it, you, you know, you, you, you've you developed. And I, I've been there, had a, a few corporate uh, parties at it uh, on a few occasions. Great experience. But what I'm just trying to establish for the audience, there there's a formula here. This is a big money business. Yeah. Um, you don't even talk in millions, you talk in bars. You, did you notice that, did you? Yeah. Right. Davies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's the old Davies. Ex it's a ten, ten <laughs> bar situation, Ex right? Yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, hold on, and yet I'm the only one here who hasn't done that. I'm like, the start for us was... Yeah, you're a bootlace that, guy. We're the boot, yeah, yeah. I, I, okay, yeah, yeah, I, I'll hear yeah. about that in a second. But Jack, the formula is, because of so much money up front, I have to get the, the attraction thing going as well to get cash flow. To get, is, mm. is that the formula? Do well, you think that, that, that will work? Uh, well, we, we didn't do it that way. We actually, uh, so I was lucky enough. I started off, uh, I worked in finance, I worked in Anglo-Irish Bank, which was a good thing <gasps> in the 90s. <laughs> Jeez. It was a very entrepreneurial bank, so a good place to, to learn. Yes, uh, I started in Cooley in 2001. I worked my way up to managing director and was sold in 2012. It gave me an opportunity to go out on my own, but it also gave me some capital. Um, but what we invested our capital in was inventory, stock. Uh, we bought as much whiskey as we could get, and we then leveraged that stock to help finance everything else we did. So we started in 2012. We launched our first Teeling branded product in 2013, January 2013. Um, um, and we, we went about building the brand and the route to market pre the distillery. The distillery was always the plan, but it doesn't happen overnight. And we felt the opportunity was then. So we want to get into the market straight away, take advantage of the opportunity and be, uh, help the category evolve and, and bring something brand new and different into the category that wasn't being serviced at the time. So I took all the learnings of what didn't work in our coolie days and I basically said, there's a blank canvas, what, what are we going to do? And I didn't go down the rural route, I went the urban route. I went, we're going to do it modern. We don't want to be old like a lot of the older style brands that are out there. Let's do a modern approach and do something that I felt was resonating with me as a modern Dubliner and what Dublin felt like at 2012, 2013, which is a cosmopolitan, open, global city. And I felt there was no whiskey brand representing that. Um, and I said, build the brand, build the brand home. And the production's fine, but it's all about the brand. So everything we do is brand centric because, you know, to, to, as I was saying earlier on, to get in the game, you have to have a world class whiskey. To win in the game, you need a world class brand. And the brand, the brand is, is the way you add value. You make alcohol in a whiskey plant, brand is how you extract that value from it. So when you come to Newmarket, our distillery in Dublin, hopefully you, you get a different experience and you, you get a very teeling experience. Um, um, so I came out from, from day one brand rather than distillery. Distillery was a means and end. It was our marketing home that also made alcohol, um, but it was our experiential marketing base. So since we've opened, we're coming up to our fourth anniversary. We opened in 2015. We've been trading since 2013, 2012. Um, uh, we've had over 425,000 people through that hopefully help tell our story when they go around the world. Um, and we went global as soon as we could because that was where the opportunity was back then. And we're now in 60 different international markets. Um, um, I think it's a lot harder for people coming into it now because you know, there's a lot more players, it's a lot noisier. And we were there, there wasn't much going on. Um, now all the multinationals are coming back in and they're all targeting probably where we're all positioning, which mm. just makes it a little bit more, more challenging. But uh, um, definitely brand, distillery, you know, and, and the building blocks was, was the whiskey that we could get our hands on at the start. So like the exact opposite to us then. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> distillery first. It was, yeah, I, right. I look, I was yeah. more responding to the opportunity at the time. Opportunity yeah. was to, to get a premium differentiated brand into the international markets, mm -hmm. take advantage of the contacts I had in, yeah. dis in distributors around the world um, and, uh, you know, build it from there. Um, but I think we've all taken slightly different yeah. approaches. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I think not even in terms of the financing model and things like that, which, which are different, but it was interesting just listening to where you're, you see your brand is fitting. You know, like you have the home that I think all of us would have said, even, you know, Jack saying we got married, Paris Court, it ticks so many boxes. Mm. June's the same with, uh, with then the Ring of Kerry, mm. um, Glendalough, Newmarket. I, like, my brewery was in Newmarket, you know, it was a cool area in, in Dublin. Um, 
I, I think they, we're also, though, in describing who your target audience is, I think that's different as well. You know, Dunes, Golf, Whiskey, Castle, you know, you can see where that fits. I'd certainly agree my perception of Teeling is that more urban, younger consumer. Younger, yeah. um, you know, your dad, the 18 to 24 year old female <laughs> with tattoos is uh, yeah. who, who John is, thinks the market is. But, but what that shows is that how the category has grown and that we're not all just, you know, it was probably the perception around Irish whiskey going back years was that it was slightly stale and it was aimed at, you know, maybe American, you know, just the American market. Whereas now, you know, we're not as many, we're in 45 different markets and North America is a big chunk of that, but Europe, Central Eastern Europe, Asia, mm. there, it's the Irish whiskey and it has to, you know, because to, to come out, you know, Jameson is 75% yep. of the market and in order for the category to continue to grow, it has to be differentiated. It has to be more premium. It has to have different offerings and it has to appeal to a, a broader audience. Yep. And I think they want that too. You know, I think that the category needs that. The category needs the, the variation. Um, and you really notice that the, the, the further your airport is from Dublin, I think is quite a good test <laughs> as to where the category is yep. and the opportunity is. Because, this, you know, we're all aligned in terms of the fact that, you know, when the category is strong, we're strong. Um, our competitors are across the water in Scotland. Our competitors are premium yeah. tequilas. Our pr competitors are the premium rums. Yeah. Um, so keeping, you know, it, they need, you need the variety like that, like going back to the days of the blue nun wine and you only had that. And, and so the more variety oh, there is, yeah, yeah. Wise, yeah. No, I, 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 I couldn't agree with you more, yeah. I totally, I totally agree. I think you have to embrace your locality. Yeah. So, you know, doing what we do, and the ring of Kerry wouldn't sit. It would just no, look, it would, no. would jar at so many and, different and, and the Romans conquered Rome first, you know? Yeah. So there's a bit of that. It's true. You know? yeah. well, in fact, <laughs> you, you took that punt in 2012, you know, you, you, you know the, which, okay, you know, we, the economy didn't go back into growth until 13. So you, you were doing it in the bad times. Now, of course, you had so much bloody money from selling. <laughs> I, 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 I wish, I wish, I wish I personally had, but uh, <laughs> no, Cooley was a public limited company. There was 300, 400 shareholders. Um, um, you know, and you're not going to do it. Look, this is the woman from Kerry. She can do the Kerry farm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you're not going to well, no, I just said it was, a, it, was a, it was a great deal at the time. It was a great deal at the time. Someone's uh, already on the CRO website trying to check out what exactly is so Yeah, so, yeah, so, yeah. so I, you know, and, and where I came from, uh, I, you know, I probably would have made a lot more money if I had put it into property at the time. Let's <laughs> just call it a spade a spade. Uh, but, uh, you know, I felt the biggest opportunity for anything in Ireland at that time was whiskey. And I still, yeah. still, no, still the, believe. The reason I'm asking the question, and by the way, this is not us just talking. Stick your love up if you want to ask a question, because we did say it was going to be an interactive yeah. discussion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But these people are on speed, are on whiskey here. <laughs> <laughs> um, but listen, what I want to ask is this, all right? We keep saying, on oh, Ireland and this whiskey thing, and we, we like... It's very rare that you see a sector where the growth is coming at you. Mm. So, like, with respect to our four brilliant panellists, they're not driving this. This is actually, the demand is out there. Same. Then the big players in this market, they've been playing premiumization for the last 10 years, which plays right to where you are. And yet, are we deluding ourselves? Because do we have a big enough player to take on the giants. Now, you know, I, I, I know people see them because the Guinness can, but the Adio is a spirits company, right? Mm. Now, you know, you see in craft beer, there's a bit of success in craft, but they don't get near the big boys. Well, Are we going to break sorry, through? That, well, I, what do you mean that, they, like, they don't get, like, <laughs> craft, craft beer in the US is now eight and a half. Oh, sorry, you're about to, see, I thought we were in Ireland. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry, <laughs> but, sorry. But, yeah, sorry. But how, 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 how many, how many trends emanate in Ireland or how many trends actually start overseas and we follow them five or ten years yeah, that's later? Exactly what that's what do. happened with craft brewing, that's what happened with small artists mm. and distilleries. So I think trends uh, start overseas and te we tend to follow them as opposed to set So them. when are but, you going to break through? Well, well, well like it's Diageo had Bushmills. Mm. Diageo owned Bushmills. They mm. failed against Jemison. Jemison's owned by Perno and they're a phenomenal success. But it's not an overnight success. So they actually created the modern category by identifying an opportunity for a lighter style of whiskey that had a lot of authenticity and provenance. And they bought Irish distillers in 1988, 89, and they focused on one brand that had no baggage, and they reinvented Irish whiskey. Uh, and they've done a phenomenal success because they've been consistent on the message for 20, 30 years. 25 over, yeah, 25 year overnight success. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Been doing it that long and investing. But 
I think the reality is consumers are not the same then as they are now, and we're responding to the opportunities the consumer provided. And, and for Irish whiskey to be relevant for the next 30 or 40 years, it needs the, the, the range right. yes. of players. In yeah. And what will happen is if the category is still very, very small. So we're 10 million cases versus Scotch, which is 90 million cases. Mm. American whiskey, which is, uh, or let's say, uh, US whiskey, which is around 40, Canadian over 30. So there's still lots of opportunity. And if you looked in your papers today, in our domestic market here, Irish whiskey's growing again. So it grew by around 5%. But the fastest growing part is the super premium segment where we all play in. 35, 40 years is that, is that When you say, when do we break through? Like having doubled over the last six years? Yeah, yeah. Five, five, look, five great. I hurt you anyway, bro. What do you mean? Do you mean domestically? Or do you mean like, no, I would have thought, no, but, you know, but being what on I'm that trying path. To, what I'm trying to establish is, what is the play? And, well, and, and is the play, because, sorry, uh, you know, John Teeling said it years ago, uh, I, I, I remember listening to say, you know, you think you're doing the right thing, chasing the multiples, and you know, and and you're selling a container load to. I don't think he would have said Aldi, but I'm, I'm using a modern day equivalent. You sell a container load to Aldi, and you're trying to get ten cent off a bottle. You know what I mean? Whereas ye can now all oh, sell. Oh yeah, okay. I, 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 so, 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 yeah. so I'm just saying, where's yeah, the breakthrough but, but going to come? But it's well, not unlike you know. We sometimes think in Ireland like it's all boom and bust. It's not going to go up in a straight line. What you're trying to do is that there's a foundation that over the next. 10, 20, I remember actually with Elaine when we w walked out of uh, your cool new distillery and Elaine commented, it's like, you're not investing for yourself, you're investing for your grandkids, for children, yeah. you know, and yeah. it's, it's that level of invest. So there'll be, there'll be, you know, there'll be dips in it and people will brick it themselves and they worry about it. But if we do the right things and build the category the right way, like Scotch is the biggest, biggest contributor to GDP in Scotland. Mm. Outside Five billion of, a year. Yeah, above oil and gas. Yeah. There's no reason that we shouldn't continue on that. That yeah. We have all the, everything is there. And if we do it the right way, don't fuck it up and take a long-term approach to it, then there's no reason that Irish, the yeah. Irish spirits industry. Just on that, I think we owe a huge credit to Jemsin, actually. They open the door, everyone's come in the door with Jemsin. And once they come in the door, what we're doing is giving them an opportunity to tear up whether it's to Teelings or to Glendalock or to Periscourt or whatever it may be. And the variety in the industry actually gives it the, um, the mass that it needs to propel it forward because that's what people are looking for. Because with scotch, they've got so many different types of mm. scotches that they can have there. And then once people come in the door, they find a scotch they like and they stick with that brand. So we are not looking to break through. We're looking to provide a new niche in the market which people will appreciate from a super premium point of view for ourselves that gives them an opportunity to drink less, but drink better quality uh, spirit. And also, I think there's, there are very different markets opening now than there would have been when John Teeling was talking about that um, Iridium you were referring to. I mean, the, the, the premiumization and, and the awareness of brands in the Far East and the Middle East, um, and this, there's a whole host of new markets that are open. And then to the Scots point, I mean, you never know what the President of the United States might do tomorrow morning in terms of excise, but at least we're not worried about having to open up a whole strand of discussions around excise duty between um, the United Kingdom and the United States. So that's an opportunity mm. for us to fill that gap. Um, and I, the other thing I think it's important to say is that, you know, coming from Brand Ireland, it's hugely important. Yeah. Um, because whiskey and like the Gulf whiskey and castles, it's like Chanel coming from France. You could have the same Chanel handbag made in Slovakia and that just wouldn't sell. So there is a provenance there that's very important. And um, we're very aware of that. Um, and so, so it's, it is a different world we're playing in and we've got to be clever. Um, it is a margin game as well. Um, it's expensive to put... Uh, people on the road. It's expensive to, um, you know, support your brand. If you're, if you're on a shelf somewhere, you've got to look after it, you've got to mind yeah. it. So all those decisions um, have to be made. And came or came, was what we're saying, I'm not sure what, step by step, Oscar um, You know, it's just came or came. And um, you take it from there. But it is a very different world we're playing in now. Mm. It's, uh, yeah, it, this industry, it's, it's not like a technology industry in that you crack some code and all of a sudden you're everywhere and you're, <laughs> you make a fortune, yeah, you yeah, turn yeah, the business, yeah. flip the business in one or two years. It's like a marathon uh, and it's grassroots marketing. Uh, there's no shortcuts because if you go too fast, you fall down yeah. quite quickly. The, the one that's kind of 
the disruptor is uh, um, don't 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 yeah <laughs> <laughs> a certain a certain MMA fighter <laughs> um, the name. who uh, but again the longevity it's a fad but the brands that you know the brands that, that we're up against they're being around for hundreds of years yeah, yeah. Uh, you talk to multinationals they don't call them some brand builders they're custodians because they're yeah. they're managing brands that are being created by someone else and that's I suppose from a business perspective for startups in in that bigger companies can't build brands from scratch. Um, they fail. They like to buy brands that are built by entrepreneurs or smaller companies that get to a certain level but and sorry, get the option. You're clearly into whiskey out of cases, but you're not comfortable with whiskey out of a cage. <laughs> are we going to go here? <laughs> Brian, you reacted. <laughs> I didn't. My reaction no, was, you said, I don't want said, to talk you about it. You said, don't make me. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. Don't, be getting, <laughs> don't be getting sure. You were yeah. an analyst in Davies. You yeah, gave yeah. people hell. <laughs> so, 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 so just, you know, but like, no, no. <laughs> talk to us. Talk to us for a moment about the McGregor phenomenon. Are you comfortable with it? You're not. Uh, no, jeez. I have no, it's, it's, look, I have a, a broader concern and it's not around whiskey. I think that a lot of people internationally, their one association mm. with Ireland is Conor McGregor. It's somewhat, it's not great, you know, if you're honest about it. Um, maybe it's good that it's some association with Ireland. Uh, you know, it's... Uh, yeah, but look, he's done a... He's, he's done whatever a the numbers job. are, he's done a phenomenal job. And people who absolutely weren't thinking of buying Irish whiskey are now buying Irish whiskey. Whether they know they're buying Irish whiskey... Or not. Uh, or not um, I, oh, we, were, I don't know. we were offered to uh, sponsor Connor for five grand back in 2013, 14, and we de declined to do that. <laughs> Because we didn't feel it was a good association with a brand. It, like, he's been from successful and fair play to him. Yeah. Um, um, and, uh, you know, what works in MMA, uh, you know, for long term, you know, value of the industry, I'd question. So yeah, do you think it's a know, bad then? I, and, and by the way, I, I'm joking. I can feel your discomfort talking about that. And I don't want to over. Well, no, because it comes across, it can come correct, across exactly. as, a bit, as being yeah. a bit snobbish or no, whatever. Yeah, yeah, and but, that's not what I but, think Jack's point is well yeah, made. But is Brian, that it risks don't worry either. Because I think what that confirms is something that you, you've touched on. You see yourselves as custodians. Mm. You know, Jerry sees himself building something for a three-generation business. Do you know? And you said earlier on, as long as we don't cock up, you know, and, and, and you'll always watch some player like that that comes along and might be a phenomenon for a while, but you know, you're, you're worried about what direction it takes your sector. The one, so the so one to thing, me, it, one just, thing would, it confirms would, again, one thing you're a certain would, type of that player. That would give me comfort around that, and I don't want to blow smoke, but uh, Perno Ricard or Irish Distillers as a market leader are are brilliant by and large and uh, you know we'll all have some you know issues that you know you mightn't be happy with but but generally they're very good as a market leader because they you know they don't want to kill the golden goose either because mm -hmm. it's such but just to give you an example we we started making gin in what they're really good at is protecting the quality of what comes out mm. because you persons, don't want yeah. you don't want bad product going out and we started making gin in 2000 and 12 or thir early 2013 and like the background the lads like we had no product knowledge at all and so we, we bought a still put it together ourselves nearly killed two of the lads putting it together one bank holiday weekend turned it on water came out everywhere the German guy who sold it to us came over and said you crazy Irish and fixed everything and we started distilling gin and the first part we were bottling everything hand bottling it on site and so you, you make gin at about 80 to 80, 85 to 90 percent proof, and then you cut it down to bottle strength. And as soon as we started cutting it down, it would go cloudy. You sometimes see it when you put your tonic in a gin, it goes somewhat cloudy. And it's just that the, the tonic in this case is reacting with the, the molecules or some of the fats in, the, in the, the gin, and it makes it go cloudy. But obviously it's fine when you've mixed a gin and tonic, but when you want a bottle on shelf, you can't have cloudy gin. So we didn't really know what was going on. And we were doing some, uh, IDL were very good in terms of just if anything goes wrong, if we can help in any way, we were buying some stuff off them. So they rang up and they said, they said to us, are you using Oro water? And of course, what's <laughs> Oro water? And turns out that uh, there's reverse osmosis water, which you yeah. need to Pure use. water. Pure yeah. water. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, so it doesn't cause, there's, there's none of the molecules in it which cause the cloudiness. And we were like, uh, no. And, and they were like, okay, well, you need to buy this kit. You need to put it. And we were like, oh, it's going to take two weeks. 
every day for the two weeks, they shipped us a thousand liter container because Oro water only lasts 24 hours yes. before mm. it becomes unpurified. Every day for two weeks, they shipped us a thousand liters of Oro water from the fox and geese down to the distillery to allow us bottle it so we could get our first batch of product out. Yeah. And there was absolutely no need for them to do that. But I'll always remember that as you know, something that they did that went up. It was a small thing, but for us, it was huge because we, yeah. we got uh, product. In, in fairness, they have the most to lose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, so I, I, I... They've I, put around a billion alone in on top of what they did in the last couple of years, so they need to protect it. They, yeah. Absolutely, but they could take a view that we'll make it as difficult as possible for these guys, for small players, or we can, you know, in some some areas be as supportive Well, it's as, good to see they change their way because they weren't so nice to my father in the 90s. I know, I know. But that was because they were Monopoly. Yeah, and you yeah. don't hold a grudge over no, them. No, no, no. no. Not at all. <laughs> uh, questions from the floor? <laughs> I, 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 I think it will when there's more, and I think they have to do that to differentiate the offerings. And look, there is environmental differences because you make, you make alcohol. So a distillery makes alcohol. It's the maturation, the, the environment that creates mm. the, the, the whiskey. Yeah. Um, so there will be micro, microclimates in Ireland that will deliver different styles. And, and again, you know, maybe in the west of Ireland, they'll have a, you know, a peat flavor profile and so forth. Then it would make sense to do it. Um, you know, at the moment, I don't think there's enough variety to justify doing it, but we do need to have proper differentiations to allow a proper healthy category. Because even if you go, let's say, to the US, you go into a liquor store, there's, not, there's walls and walls of scotch, walls and walls of American whiskey, and then this tiny little add-on of Irish whiskey. So, so to be a proper category, you have to have different types of propositions, and, and that would definitely help. But it, but it has to be an evolution. Yeah. You know, we can't start doing it straight off if you're yeah. just introducing people in the category. But Brian, talk to us about your barrels or your ca yeah, like That's significant for you, isn't it? Uh, your well, yeah, because... You this know, man eats, sleeps and drinks barrels. Uh, <laughs> you know. As, as a, you know, a small company where um, we, you know, clearly we've a 13-year-old whiskey. We've only been around for nine years. So as Jack talked about earlier on, we invested in stock, so we bought in some liquid that Noel, Noel would have made. It's <laughs> mad, the connections. But in order, rather than just putting that liquid, back, sticking a label on it and putting it back out, you want to try and add something to it. So we would have bought different, we would have went to Japan and we acquired a small number of Mizunara casks, which are really rare, really hard to manage, and put whiskey in that. It had a cool impact on the liquid, and it just added a feature to it. So. You know, as Jack said, the maturation, whether it's the casks or the climate, they have a big impact on the, the flavor profile. And so by doing that, it just allows you, one, to take a bit of ownership of the story until you're at a stage that you're producing your own, but also then to have a different offering so that it's not just another one of what already exists, that as the category evolves, that you've got a slightly differentiated product. And I think, mm. you know, over time, that's, that's something that you okay. need to Any do. Any other questions? Yeah, on that master brewer thing, is it the, the getting the skills, getting the skills, and the the, the actual uh, particular uh, brand or whatever you're after producing there on that particular occasion? How do you hold on to that uh, particular formula? Who has the skill? Who is passing it on to who? And is there a chance for apprenticeships for all that sort of thing? Yeah. Are you going to be building on it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, government tap into it to make uh, jobs for people? They should, uh, because um, <coughs> there are, there's not Huge enough job. people with the, 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 the knowledge um, and the experience, um, and particularly around blending. Um, and the whole thing about whiskey and spirits in general is once, it's not like wine or beer, that it can mm. change all the time. But once you find something people like, you have to keep it consistent the whole time. And that's challenging. Um, and particularly when you're smaller and you do things on a batch basis. Uh, so there's, there's, you know, it'll have to evolve. And, and, you know, our master distiller, our master blender is American. But he worked for us in Cooley and he was the first person I hired because I'm not technical. I'm business, whatever that is. Um, uh, you can blame uh, the BCOM for that. Um, <laughs> but, uh, uh, um, so I needed that technical skill set and, and someone that shared the same kind of vision of what we wanted to do. Um, uh, and you can see around Ireland, a lot of the distilleries are going to America and places like that just to bring the skill sets in. And it'll take a time to evolve. And there is now college courses that do uh, brewing and distilling courses uh, like in DIT um, um, down in Carlo. They've been talking about doing it for quite some time as well. Mm. Um, uh, and down in UCC for a long time, they had it as an add on. 
but most of them just end up going to Middleton and Cork. Um, so it will it'll take time to evolve, but there is a skills gap yeah. at the moment. Yeah. I think there is, and I think that's where there is a huge gap in the industry in terms of those primary services with distillers, blenders, but also in the secondary services there in terms of warehousing, bottling, label, all that infrastructure <laughs> that um, they have over in Scotland. Get Jack start. <laughs> they, they, they have all this infrastructure ready in Scotland, and if we want to grow this industry, we need Enterprise Ireland's help, we need the IDA's help, or whoever who can put up the funding, because uh, there's a huge opportunity here. There's 130 30 distilleries in Scotland. There's 25 here or so, yeah. but if you quantify and qualify them, they're relatively small. There's a few that are big, but we could have our own uh, indigenous industry here producing a huge amount of GDP, using our own natural resources, barley, water, our microclimates, and we could take on Scotch. And is there, um, is there a little bit of reluctance on the government party? Yeah. I no think you're joined by, <laughs> no, no, no. you know, Elaine, who's I think you might, right. yeah, they're, they're a bit schizophrenic about it is probably the, the way I'd describe it, but certainly they, they manage, I think they're becoming more alive to the opportunity, especially around how, um, and it's, it's driven by visitors and it's driven by, because they want to come and visit distilleries. So, for example, they're running, I know Fault Your Island are running out a big programme for the next three years called Taste the Island, mm -hmm. which is all about, um, in our case, we'll be open this summer um, with our gin. We've put it in, positioned it in a way that it's, it's very suitable for food. And so we will be doing things with local producers there. And that's what they're interested in. And it seems like they're putting their toe in the water on this just to see where it, it lands and where it sits. Well, but in rural Ireland, I think it's, it's such an opportunity. It is, yeah. Um, and it's, it's difficult to get... Um, it's a technical enough industry and because because there's been a gap of maybe 40, 50 years where the skills just weren't there. I saw Irish distillers just appointed a new cooper for the first time in 75 years recently. That's bonkers. But I think what, what, <laughs> what will happen and just to go back... A cooper to is somebody who, makes, the, who the knows how to uh, make the casks. Uh, the point about yeah. the, with the similarities or differences between craft beer, what you have seen in craft brewing is that now... It, the time frame is shorter because you can go away in, in two years because the product is more immediate and you can learn a lot in two years that you don't get with whiskey because it just takes a much longer time before you see the impact of what you do. But you have seen a lot of brewers domestically. They've gone to Little Creatures in Australia. They've gone to Brewdog in Scotland. They've gone off to the US. And now they're coming back. I know Wicklow, Wicklow Wolf just hired a guy who I think had come back from Brewdog, which would be quite a high-profile craft brewery. Mm -hmm two years of experience there that you can bring back. It won't happen as quickly within, within whiskey or distillation, but you can see how if they feel that there's an industry there, that if I go away and spend two or three years doing this, I'll come back and there is going to be an opportunity. Yeah, there's, there's Harriet Watt there as well. But I think there is a kind of a different um, approach. I wouldn't I don't know what to say, schizophrenic approach, but mm. I got... Um, I got huge help from Board B in terms of the branding and the positioning of it in our table and all that stuff from the start. And I got huge help from Enterprise Ireland with a feasibility study. But I think then there is a kind of, um, there is a perception that whiskey is kind of old Ireland and it's not a tech company. But I think that is slowly changing as, um, as the, these yeah, guys are established. That, that's so frustrating because mm. the one thing your industry needs, you know, like, and this is, you know, to your point about government initiatives, you know, that uh, why we're not government funded building a man, you know, we build, we're looking for data centers. We need a large bonded warehouse yeah. that is ginormous. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. That yeah, but you, you know, you, you know why? You, like, you know, because on the other hand, or out the other side of the mouth, they're talking about the public alcohol bill and they can't be seen, you know, there <laughs> yeah. is, you know, we have yeah, TVs yeah. come in who but, want to shake but, our but hands. This, yeah, less, but oh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, I mean, but, but, I said uh, to Gavin earlier, I started drinking whiskey yeah. to drink less. Yeah. And it sounds like a complete Higher contradiction. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because wine, I think, yeah. you know, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, my view, my yeah. view is if you go to, you go to Scotland, purposefully. you go to Scotland or, or Kentucky, they're so proud of what yeah. the industry is. Yeah. In Ireland, we're, we're in a, I don't know how, yeah, we would say yeah. ashamed or that we don't want to be seen to be yeah. stigma. And, and these are alcohol brands are real brands. You know, there's only, if you think about it, there's, there's Kerry, Kerry Gold, 
there's Baileys, there's Guinness, oh, there's Jemison. These are global brands. Um, they're adding massive value mm. to Ireland's Inc. And we as a nation are a bit like, oh, well, we yeah, can't really we, be seen we, to we, we travel, you know, you travel a lot. Yeah. You, internationally, the perception is very positive. And like, mm. look, it's not to be, it's not, this conversation isn't black and white. Yeah. You know, there is definitely, you know, we have an issue with alcohol and our relationship with alcohol. But I think in terms of where there is an opportunity, premium consumption is about consuming less, consuming better. Mm -hmm. You go internationally, the reputation Ireland has as a drinks producer, three out of our four global brands, our drinks brands, is really positive. And then you come back and it's like, where do you, oh, I work in the drinks industry. And you're like, you know, and it is that sort of, it's almost like yeah. you're... Pure. Well, our experience yeah. has been hugely supportive at home. And I think that's jobs driven as well. So the factory that we're gone into was a significant employer in the region. Um, you know, we, we now have four full-time employees. And to be honest with you, depending on where you are, I think maybe in Dublin, because, you know, your local TDs and your local politicians on this side of, 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 of the country have so much choice in terms of where employment is, where we are in rural Ireland, where people want to stay there. Mm. Whereas in my day, you know, the perception was that if you wanted to be successful, which now means spending four hours a day on the M50, it seems, <laughs> um, you know, you left. Whereas now technology is what it is. There's a completely different term around so that hasn't been our experience yeah. our experience though has been and I think Gavin you opened with it is that I mean I've had people talk to me about our brewery um, and through gritted teeth I'm trying to explain the difference this is a very fundamental difference so a lot of I think the reluctance to to step in is that there is a lack of understanding uh, on a very technical living and that's maybe that's something that the industry needs to do more of but certainly um, our experience has been incredibly positive um, but at the same time, when I said schizophrenic, I meant at a national level, you know, um, locally it's been. And there is, I think to Jerry's point, there is absolutely no reason why we could not be uh, filling all the roles of, in the secondary production from Ireland and not from Dublin, where it's expensive to own land to do that, not where land is expensive. But we're going to mature our whiskey on the ocean at home, lucky again with the lovely red line around that particular area. But I mean, you know, there needs to be a bit of a, a, a excuse the pun, maturation in the way we approach the various maturation, elements yeah. as well that goes on with it. Um, and I just would say something, so when we were coming here today, people said uh, to me, you know, if I could ask you to do one thing, what would you do? And I would just say to everybody in the room, you know, when you go into an establishment or you go in anywhere and you think this is an industry worth supporting, ask for us and ask for the brands by name. And I think I had to ask for Dingle Gin 20 times in Dublin before I got it, <laughs> you know, and then feigning absolute, you know, horror that this establishment didn't have it. And so, you know, we are consumer led in terms of our industry, but that needs to be Irish consumers as well, lads. I mean, mm, it's very powerful if people go in and ask for it, but there is a huge opportunity to fill you know, to play into this this business, especially across, since over the water, they must be getting very nervous about the uncertainty of, of, of where the future is on it. So ju just on that, like... I'm conscious of time, so you tell me whenever you want. You're, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, but uh, we definitely will have you out before 8 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, just on that, like Paris Court, it was about, it was about uh, providing employment for local people. We have 10 local lads up there working on the process side of it. We're using barley from Wicklow, we're using barley from Cork as well. But we're, it, and there's about 10 people working in the visitor centre. So there's about 29 people that are employed there on the state. We're reusing the old buildings there. We're using the water that we have under the ground, the barley that we have in the fields. And it's a perfect export product. So I think there's a, there needs to be a kind of a perception change from government in terms of appreciating that we can provide farmers, the secondary industry there, uh, and the distilling industry, if we provide them with some, port, some support that we could really create some premium brands here and really add value. As, as Jack was saying, five billion to the um, Scottish economy each year is the whiskey industry, the Scots whiskey mm -hmm. industry. It's 25% of their GDP for Scotland. It's a lot of money. It's a lot. Of, yeah, and if we have another 25 distilleries coming, even if we put them at five million along with the 20... You know, you're, you're, you're talking a quarter to half a billion of an investment. That, mm. You know, like that, this is very significant. Mm. And we just have to get around that uh, dilemma we have of... Yeah, boom, say, boom say, bust. La, la, la. yeah but, but people saying that la, nearly embarrassed to say they, they, they oh, work yeah, in the yeah, 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 yeah. industry. Yeah, the uh, industry, the industry yeah. Mm. Um, well, listen, oh, so look at all the hands going up now. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. Look, well, then, look, is it okay, Elaine? We'll take... Uh, 
All right, show your hands then. Who wants to come in? All right, we'll start there, sir. Then yeah, yeah they gave me the mic. Uh, thank you, Gavin. <laughs> uh, quick question, just for, you were talking about investment. How much of your time is spent either worrying about investment, raising investment, and how does that impact your ownership of, of the asset and the brand and company? Uh, <laughs> like we, we, all, we all took a different route to it. Yeah. So um, as Gavin said, we did the, the bootstrap approach to it. But, um, so like we started it off with our own money. We set it up in 2011, and we didn't raise money till 2013, 2014. So, um, and like there was, you know, I was going back to the sort of romanticism or romantic notion of entrepreneur. Like that period, not only was it what was going on in the economy, but uh, you're starting off, at the time for me it was two businesses and it was sleepless nights it was like how am I gonna two young kids at the time how am I gonna pay my mortgage you know and then when you as you develop a little bit more and you take people on it's like you realize that their you know their lives are at, yeah. at risk and, and that becomes even more pressure so um it was only 2011 it was only probably 2015 2016 where we were took on kind of big boy investment outside of family and friends and that's the stage where you were able to sort of take a medium term view to it and decide look at where you should be allocating capital and even then you have the same same sort of worries all the time yeah. but you spend a lot of time worrying about it yeah i, I think uh, people ask you all the time what's the hardest thing building the distillery and was paying the bills <laughs> i'll be honest with you um because when we signed uh the contract to build the distillery which was over five million, we had half a million in our bank account and uh, a lot of stock and uh, 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 a bank that wasn't going to give us any more. So it was a basically a leap of faith. And I knew the builder personally, which was a big mistake. So uh, there's no way we could have, uh, uh, you know, got away from delaying payments or anything like that. So, so it, it's a very capital intensive industry. And even now that we're, you know, cash flow is king, uh, you know, you really have to manage your cash flow because you're constantly laying down stock. Um, so it's eating up all your money, you're investing in marketing, um, uh, and you just have to keep things going. So it's a constant challenge. So the more successful you are, the more whiskey you have to lay down, the more money you have to spend on marketing, the more warehouses you have to rent or build. Uh, it's a, it can be a vicious cycle if you get it wrong. If you, if you go too fast, too quickly, uh, you can get yourself into trouble quite quickly. But the good thing about the industry, it's a weird thing with the industry, is, is that whiskey appreciates in value rather than depreciates in value. So um, we were managing, we, we could work with Ulster Bank to get asset back financing on our inventory, which transformed things quite a bit for us. I think that's an interesting point where yeah. a lot of people see it as the challenge has been, I need to you know, get liquid in a bottle. And once I've liquid in a bottle, that'll be it, you know? And kind of there's this almost idea that I'll arrive into Boston Harbor and there'll be people out there with their <laughs> notebooks taking down their orders for how many pallets we want. <laughs> it doesn't and, work like And that. it doesn't. <laughs> and like you realize, uh, like you said, the, you know, you need whiskey in your bottle to, to be in the game, to win in the game. It's about your brand and it's investing in it and it's marketing. And like we, we've 25 people we employ as well and seven of them are on the ground in the US and it's a, it's a huge expense. It's a huge stress having 25 year old Irish people in the booze industry <laughs> yeah. uh, on the ground. You're always dreading that Monday morning phone call. But uh, it, it is, it, but that's what's required. So you've got the initial investment, but then in three or four or five years' time, there's an even bigger investment to continue to lay down more stock, build the brand, invest in marketing, and invest in people. So it's uh, Jerry. For for yep. the next few years, what's the ratio coming from visitors? What's the ratio coming from liquid? Uh, coming to the distillery. Um, Tough question. <laughs> God, I'm only, I'm only starting off on this. We, we opened the vi uh, distillery there about three weeks ago, and uh, traction has been slow so far, but we have a media campaign. But uh, the, the whole uh, operating model is to build it slowly out of the distillery. And, um, and then as soon as we secure distribution overseas, that will have people on the ground there and we'll be able to do it. But in the first few years, the first three years, really, the majority of the revenue really will be coming from the, distiller, uh, the visitor center itself. Mm -hmm. And through our corporate functions upstairs and our tastings and other bits and pieces, that um, we have a 20-year business plan. Mm. <laughs> it's a long-term investment, and it's it's the worst get-rich-quick scheme ever. So, <laughs> <laughs> and I think um, I think it's important as well to say that it's a margins game as well. So, I mean, you think you know you have. To, I was talking about this last night, and and for us, the stage we're at now, you know, you have to resist the temptation you know, for being in my local rap mines, O'Brien's, you know, because they'll slaughter us because there are so many things already there. So, um, you know, we can keep a lot of the margin at the distillery door. So, you know, it, when you talk about the percentage, 
you know, mm. if you're talking about turnover, it's one thing. But, you know, if you can sell it at the distillery door, you're keeping that margin. So, yep. um, <laughs> you know, so it depends on how you, you cut it. Very good. Yeah. Uh, back. Yes. Yeah, we'll just text now. They're, they're coming. Right, okay. Well, let's do so once it's wrapped over, there's enough of us to move chairs. Yeah, we'll just get the last one. Well, whiskey has... Sorry, I couldn't see you. you were the, whiskey is protected by a, a geographic indicator file, and it has to be a minimum 40%. So, so in terms of whiskey, if you're going to call it whiskey, it has to be a minimum 40%. Gin, I think, is 34, 37 and a half percent. Yeah, yeah. um, but there is, but there's, there's, but there are. There, there's, there's, the trends is that in, within cocktails, that it's, it's lower amounts of spirit within the cocktail. There's a... Virgin Mary. Virgin Mary bar, mm. yeah, yeah. Um, Guinness did the uh, the open or the open gate uh, yeah. bar and in, in clear, January. clear campaign. Uh, yeah, um, <laughs> so it is. It's a huge trend. Mm. It's not change. I, I think that's. I think yeah. if the if the last ten years were about premiumization, uh, I think next it's it's around low and no consumption and different consumption of alcohol. I gotta say though, if it's the taste is is still not there. If you taste a non-alcoholic spirit, which doesn't make any sense because yeah, it's yeah. not a spirit, cool. uh, but the Seed Lip and other brands like that, they just don't taste the same because of the mouthfeel. You won't get the same mouthfeel because it's the alcohol that gives you that mouthfeel. Um, so, you know, uh, there's obviously a growth towards non-alcohol consumption, but do they have to be spirits or, or pretend spirits? Why don't you just drink a good, like, you know, cocktail made with natural ingredients rather than something that's artificially made? So, you know, I think it's a bit of a fad. Reality is people are going to drink what they enjoy, and I don't understand why they have to pretend that they're drinking if they're not drinking. You know, well, mm -hmm. well, I can a little bit, because... Uh, because I, you know, I, I don't know, I think it's a cultural thing. Yeah. I think the culture is changing, and uh, the question is, like, if you go to... Uh, a non-drinking place. They drink co they drink uh, milkshakes and different things like that in more Muslim yeah. countries, and they're they're really tasty. Yeah. So why why would you have to go into a, a bar and pretend that you're drinking a cocktail? Because the main out social outlet in the country is still I know, a, but yeah. still a bar. The, the, I know, but the, like, the but, fourth but, but, biggest but selling fake, cocktail fake in a manner is, is a non-alcoholic cocktail. Yeah, I, I'm just wondering: are they, so, are they a certain yeah. age group, or the younger people? They won't really care too much if it's. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think in a generation, the whole how we consume alcohol will have. Yeah, I, th I think you're completely right, material. and this is where it goes back to: the volumes are coming down in alcohol mm. consumption worldwide, but value is going up. So it's a creating more revenue, but people are drinking more um, premium spirits and they're drinking less of them. So instead of go out and have six drinks, you go out and have two good whiskies or three good whiskies and, and, and call it a night. So um, as you were saying, perceptions have changed and our attitude to alcohol has definitely changed. It's quality over quantity now. Mm. But to your point as well, what, what talking to the people who own um, the various... Um, off licenses around the place, they, they're saying that it's all or nothing. So you're either 0% or you're 40 or 37.5. That the, the, the 20% and the 21% aren't really working at the moment. So it's one or the other, which is interesting because that to me says that the same person will drink a whiskey on a Friday night and four of them. But if they met somebody on a Tuesday evening, they might decide to have a non-alcoholic drink. So I, I don't think, yeah, the, yeah, I don't think it's one is, or the other. There there's, a, there's there different. Is a, but there is a quality thing. I think yeah. within spirits, we're not there yet. Within brewing, there has been uh, technological advances in how you brew non-alcoholic beer, where they can be fully brewed, as opposed to like caliber back in the day. It was just a moxie load of sugar that was put into yeah. it to give it that mouthfeel. Whereas with Heineken Zero and things like that, they have invested in the technology of brewing a non-alcoholic beer. And so the flavor profile is getting better all the time. And maybe with spirits, there's a, there's a similar evolution. OK, just going to go back to the floor. Uh, thanks a lot for all the insights. Um, obviously, route to market is uh, critical for you know the overseas territories, um, but it's only half the battle. So you get a great distributor, and you're in country X. But um, just in terms of getting the product, you know, off the shelves, uh, how do you, are you getting past the? We get educating the consumer basically that it, you've got a new brand now, a uh, new, new opportunity there. Yeah, very good question. I think firstly, you're only as good as your partner because we're not like a Diageo or a, a, a Perno who have their own distributor. So you're always reliant on finding an independent distributor in your export markets. And it's hard, hard to find one because you're only an agency brand, you're one of many. Um, so, okay, you find a good one, uh, you get distribution, you end up on the shelf. Um, you want to be on the shelf in the right place, especially when you're new. 
So you, do, you don't want to go straight into a supermarket shelf because no one will know who you are and you gather dust and you fail. But you want to be, you know, in France, for example, we only go into the Cavis channel, which is a specialty channel where they're hand sold for you. So, so they can tell your story to the consumers before they, they buy and they take it home with them or in a good bar where the bartender will be your sales guy. So they're hard to get into, but you build your brand there. Um, uh, I also think, you know, modern digital media is a key tool so that if someone sees it on a menu or sees you on a, on, 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 on a back bar, they just go straight on their phone and go, what the hell is that? And if they can find you and get your messages across very simply, I think it makes your life a lot easier. And uh, beforehand, it was like Chinese whisper. You tell your importer, you tell your wholesaler, you tell the retailer, who then try and tell the consumer, and they get lost in translation. So, so um, um, it's a little bit easier, but it's still damn hard. And, and digital media is just becoming now you know, very expensive and, and hard to navigate globally. Um, 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 and for us, at our stage of evolution, we've had to up our game in terms of route to market partners, and particularly like key markets like the US, just to have the, the muscle to get on the right shelf. And now we have to spend all the money on creating that consumer pull. So you want to push and pull kind of symbiotic together, but it's easier said than done. Yeah, and just it, totally weird, same, trying to move up the food chain in terms of your distributor partners. The only thing I'd add to what you said is that we don't even look at cities, like we don't look at Boston or Chicago or Dallas. You look at neighborhoods and we try and employ what's like a, a lighthouse strategy where you get like, you know, if you pick a neighborhood, you get four bars and you can, like Jack was saying, if you can get the barman or, you know, in a nice retailer where you can get the guy to tell your story, if you can do that in a small concentrated space, and then the idea of being a lighthouse is that sort of emanates out. But it, we're talking, like someone said, in Chicago, you could build a brand in a 10 block radius, you know, <laughs> like they are little mini towns in themselves. And if you can pick the right one, find the right accounts, because we can't compete with, you know, Perno, Diageo and that. So it's, you've got to be smart with it as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. I was just wondering about your product lines. Um, I know you've suffered a lot in the setup costs, and um, you haven't told us about the process time. I know some whiskies take an, an aging process. Uh, you have mentioned maturation, and two of you have mentioned gin. So is this the second product line, the gin? Okay. Or do you all of a gin line? <laughs> and then if, you, if, if in turn you have this gin line, and now, now like we can have you know, raspberry, strawberry, Orange, nice pink whatever. Gin then. Ro rose, and rose, not pink. <laughs> and rose gin. And this, and you could also subsequently then become known for your gin product, which then may make the your purchaser then try your whiskey product as yeah. well. Brian so it may be a backdoor to say offsetting your other costs up as well and increasing your product line. Yeah, it's it's as de well. it's definitely one. I think if you ask um, if you ask a lot of the small distilleries the boom in craft or small batch irish gin has been huge because you're absolutely right in terms of you know you can produce it you can bottle it you can ship it to your distributor even domestically within a you know four weeks six weeks uh, so if you so if you can build a if you can produce a really good product we're in Wicklow, we're in the Garden of Ireland. All our botanicals are locally sourced. We have, I think we're the only gin distillery that has a now two full-time foragers. And so we build a story around that and it's been amazing. And now having started as a, as a whiskey company or the idea to be a whiskey company, we're not quite 50-50, but I think last year it was 45-55 in terms of whiskey gin sales globally. And within Ireland, it was 60% gin. So the gin thing has been huge. Um, and yet, as that evolves, so you know, people are now into, they've moved into flavored gins, or we have a rose gin, which is a naturally produced pink gin. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, and, and that, that offer, so it, it's been, it has been, because just from a, a cash flow point of view, all the things we talked about and for whiskey are... Did you, did you see it coming? I, I, I was no. dragged up in the pub business. So I, I just, this gin thing just knocks me over because, you know, it was a straight... Like, uh, you wouldn't even put ice and a lemon in it. Like, yeah. you know, and then now it has to come in a water crystal bowl with half a deli counter <laughs> uh, in it uh, and things called botanicals. But, but we're late to the game. Well, how we're, did that happen? We're, we're late to the game. This, this was been happening. 10 years this ago what, in, this in, what in Spain. Saying about 10 about, years yeah. behind about trends. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so, they don't so, start here. But when, but when we do adopt a trend, it goes like wildfire. Yeah. <laughs> That's it's, the, that's it's the boom thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You hear John Teeny talking about cannabis. What share do you guys 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 but it's an interesting oh, thing yeah. that, you know, how different markets are. And we're definitely behind. And like, Tell you Australia what, what, seems to be at the back. You know, like, like, what, like what, you can get another 10 years. What's yeah. happening in Europe won't happen in Australia yeah, for 10 what years. What you should do, what a really good way of looking at it is follow Fever Tree are a quoted company and follow where they are, <laughs> markets they are entering because. China uh, owns, yeah. Well, Sorry, no, because what's the name of that company? Fever Tree. Fever Tree. Oh, no, Fever Tree yeah, Tonic. Yeah, so obviously. one of the reasons, it's actually, it's one of the few trends that is only coming to the US now as well. And the reason is that gin and tonics, uh, tonic in the US comes from the splash gun, which is just diluted sugared water. You know, you get it in the gun behind the bar. Nick, so no one's just close the door because uh, there, there's a drum competition outside there. <laughs> but, I know but, the breeze is lovely, but uh, we we'll, yeah, yeah, but okay. but no, but no one no one is going to buy a ten or twelve dollar gin if seventy percent of it is just coming you know of the the mix mm. is coming from a splash gun. So as Fever Tree talk about opening new markets and you see Fever Tree in the U.S., you now have premium tonic in the U.S. and those states where Fever Tree are talking about growing, you're seeing gin and tonics yeah. as you are talking about them being consumed in goblets and botanicals. Mm. And but all to, that but to go back to, to the gin and whiskey question, uh, we made a conscious decision not to go into gin. Uh, we probably left a lot of money on the table because if we did go into gin back in 2013, 14, like Dingle obviously was first mover and, and uh, you know, everyone has kind of followed on from there. <coughs> I um, argue that. Cause, <laughs> or, well, it's, well, was, well yeah. they were probably, what, 2011, 12? No, no. The I, gin? I, I think... I, Anyway, it's, it's, yeah. an, it's a debate we Which have. There you go. Yeah. Um, 2012. Or but I, I, think, yeah. I think the consumers are quite different. I'll be honest with you. you know, I, th I think the brand equity, again, I'm not, I think it's hard to stretch it across multiple spirits categories. Um, uh, and we thought, you know, well, well one, because we invested so much in whiskey, we had to make whiskey work. <laughs> and we put all our effort into, we still put all our effort into, into whiskey. Mm. So it would be some of the, uh, the struggles yeah. between spreading, you know, the Glenlock across the whiskey. And, yeah, and, I, I, and I suppose, though, like, typically with smaller craft distilleries, you're known as a distillery, not necessarily a brand within just one category. Yeah. And so you do have a bit more flexibility. I agree with you. It's, uh, you know, it is a challenge to... Um, it is a challenge to stretch it. The only thing where it has benefited is in the US where they're re really seasonal about how they drink. So like come Memorial Day weekend at the start of May, everyone goes to white spirits. Mm. And then Labor Day weekend, it's brown spirits again. And you don't want to, you know, they don't want to talk to you about whiskey in July because it's 30 degrees. And by the same token, they don't want to talk to you about gin and tonics in December because mm -hmm. people are drinking whiskey. Mm -hmm. So it, it's just, it's benefited that way because you always have a, you're, all, you know, an always on with your mm -hmm. distributor. But look, we'll see, I guess we'll see mm -hmm. over, <laughs> well, see well, over time. Speaking. Yeah. Our gin still is on its way from Italy. Um, so we'll have, we're putting it in in about two or three weeks' well, time. The only recommendation I would have is don't have Brian in his room. <laughs> get, a, get a professional to do it, you. Brian has been very generous. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, yeah. thank Gavin. Gavin, thank you very much. You're going to. Um, we'd like to thank you all today. So thank, thank you for coming. To thank Gavin because he was thank here you. since one o'clock. Yes, and I so. Been <laughs> <coughs> we don't, we normally give drink, but we know that yeah. uh, that's not your yeah. beverage, so we give you the small present. Great. And uh, for the <laughs> talk about giving sand to the Arabs. So again, if that's we're Jemison giving, there, it's, yeah, not yeah, Jemison, it's wine. Yeah. So we all the talk about wine. Again, <laughs> a special thanks to all of you, to Jack. Uh, to Brian, to Jerry, and to June. Thank you again. It was fantastic. It would have, wow. I'd have sat here. It was an amazing. Yeah. Thank you again. And a great audience. And a great audience. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um,